New coronation details are revealed as the family celebrates Easter. It's one of my favorite events of the year because we see the family out in full force. They look extremely royal and it's just uh, the start of spring really is when we see this. Princess Kate called the walkabout with Harry and Meghan the hardest thing she has ever had to do. They're mourning themselves, you know, like the Queen was William's grandmother. You know, we've heard that they had a great relationship, William, Kate and her late majesty, the Queen. Um, they're very close. I'm sure that, you know, that was a devastating loss. Plus, Emmy Award-winning filmmaker Tom Jennings speaks to us about his new documentary, Charles, in his own words. And he's actually very funny, and he has this great sense of humor on top of it. So there's a complexity to him that I think uh, a lot of people either aren't aware of or uh, disregard. We've got that plus so much more on today's Royally Us. Hello to our fellow royal lovers and welcome to Royally Us. I'm Christina, that's Christine, and we got some coronation details. We had an Easter celebration, so there's a lot to talk about this week. I love this time of year. Even if we didn't have the coronation, Easter service always feels like such a royal event. And we have the coronation coming up, so it's it's a good time to be a royal watcher. Definitely. All right, before we get into it all, like always, let's see what you guys said to me at last week's show. Anne says, if Kate isn't allowed to wear a tiara to the king's coronation, when is she allowed? Would love to see a tiara on her head for this very special occasion. I feel like we couldn't agree more. Give the people what they want. Seriously. They want <laughs> and then Allie says, why are you missing? representing the Markle versus Markle case. The judge has not thrown the case out. Sam has been given 14 days to refile. It's really not a case of punishing Megan, more a case of bringing her to justice. Well, we'll have to see what happens. We'll see if she does refile and we will be following it. But yeah, it seems like she definitely wants to, um, you know, you know, tell her side and make her case known. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I do think that these legal cases, which we'll talk about another one today, can be really complicated if you're not actually a legal expert. I know I'm always cross-checking with lawyer friends. What does this mean? What are we what are we talking about here? Totally. Yes. It is, there's a lot, a lot of moving parts in all of this all the time. Yeah. But like we said before, the royal family um, attended Easter Day service. So let's get into our royal roundup. Princess, Prince William and Princess Kate celebrated with their three children. And this was out, out, actually Louis's first Easter Day celebration with the family. So very excited. They were pictured outside of St. George's Chapel in Windsor before the holiday service began. And they coordinated in blue outfits with Kate and Charlotte donning a royal blue dresses and the boys opting for some navy suits. Um, Louis looked adorable wearing his blue pastel shorts and he held his mother's hand outside the chapel and they were joined by, of course, King Charles, uh, Camilla, Princess Anne and Sir Timothy Lawrence. So uh, Princess Eugenie, Princess Beatrice, the whole family kind of came out for this. And this was the first, of course, the first Easter service since the death of Queen Elizabeth. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot to um, to celebrate this Easter and also a lot to remember as well. Definitely. You know, this is a this is actually a private family event. It's sort of like the Christmas service where even though it's a big display, we see them every year. The press has a big setup. It is a private event. So it was nice to see the whole family getting together for this. I thought that was really special. And the the Wales's color coordination with their outfits every time they step out as a family, their outfits are perfectly coordinated and every parent who has had to coordinate family photos knows how difficult that is <laughs> so it is so hard it's so impressive but i think this really drives home how important family is to the royal family um how pivotal religion has become you know still such a center point for the family even after the passing of her majesty queen elizabeth ii mm -hmm. and it's just it's one of my favorite events of the year because we see the family out in full force they look extremely royal and it's just uh, the start of spring really is when we see this it really is so beautiful and it's it's hard to believe that this also happened on the second anniversary of prince philip's death i can't believe it's been two years so um yes uh, you know a big you know, a time to come together with family and um, mark a, um, a a big day as well. I can't believe it's been two years. No, I honestly, with we talk about royal news and these big historical events happening. And it seems like just yesterday, we say that all the time, you know, it, it was just yesterday, but also 100 years ago. Exactly. But, you know, it, it was nice to see several tributes on social media. Mm -hmm. um, uh, commemorating the second anniversary of Prince Philip's death, just showing that he is still relevant and he's still such a historical figure. Right. And, you know, 
the beacon for the royal family. Definitely. And it was also uh, Charles and Camilla's 18th wedding anniversary, too. So this is a big weekend. <laughs> what a big weekend. I know it must have been tough because, as we said, it was the first Easter service without Queen Elizabeth II. It's their wedding anniversary. It's also the <laughs> anniversary of Prince Philip's death. There's a lot going on. <laughs> a lot going on. A lot going on. I can't on. imagine what the brunch afterwards was like. <laughs> seriously, seriously. And like you said, a lot going on. And the coronation is just a few weeks away. And Buckingham Palace announced how the king and queen consort will travel to and from the crowning ceremony. So they are set to ride to Westminster Abbey in the Diamond Jubilee stage, a state coach and return to Buckingham Palace in the gold state coach. So the Di Diamond Jubilee state coach was commissioned to commemorate Queen Elizabeth's 60th anniversary of seating the throne back in 2012 and has only ever conveyed the monarch, though occasionally accompanied, accompanied by the consort or a visiting head of state. So it will be part of the parade known as the King's Procession, and it will the carriage will go through Buckingham Palace, through the center gate, and proceed down the mall, passing through the Admiralty Arch and south of King Charles's uh, island. So it's going to be like the whole parade. So And it starts at 11 a.m. local time. And this is, I mean, they're going to be riding in style. It's amazing. Yeah, the Diamond Jubilee State Coach is very impressive. Not anywhere near as, as impressive as the Gold State Coach that is returning them back to Buckingham Palace. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, the return to Buckingham Palace is going to feature, it, I think it's going to be almost like a parade with service members, mm -hmm. um, bands, horse guards, all on parade. And I think it's just the atmosphere is going to be really incredible. But now that we do have that map that sort of... Um, mm -hmm. right. Uh, the the route of the procession, people can start to plan where they might stand, where they might try and catch a glimpse of the royal family. Oh, it's going to be great. Well, there are some lucky people that are going to have probably a front row seat to all of this. So Buckingham Palace also announced that the king invited over 850 community and charity representatives to the crowning ceremony. So over 450 British Empire medalists recipients were invited to see the service from um, the ancient abbey itself. Meanwhile, over 400 young people, some representing charities chosen by King Charles and Queen Camilla, will witness the festivities from St. Margaret's Church at Westminster Abbey. So from St. Margaret's Church, hundreds of young people will, like we said, see them um, in what is being described as a special private viewing and get to watch the coronation procession depart Westminster Abbey when the service ends. So this includes 200 involved with the Prince's Trust, the Prince's Foundation. So this is, these are people that are working um, for charities and organizations that are near and dear to the king and queen's heart. So very lucky for them. They're going to get a front row seat and, uh, you know, going to be witnessing history right there. And it's really incredible. You know, they've prioritized um, these people from these charities. Also, obviously, military service members, former veterans I have so, will, might have some prioritized viewing points. Uh, and they really want to, you know, it's a way of thanking the people who are working so hard for, for people around the country, for the country, um, for them to be part of this hugely historic day. Oh, definitely. I cannot wait. Um, this was a fun a boys outing. So Prince William and Prince George had some bonding time at the Premier League. So they were photographed in the stands at Villa Park in Birmingham for a close soccer match between Aston Villa and Nottingham Forest. So they wore almost like They love a good matching moment. Yes, so seriously. They, <laughs> seriously, they're loving this dark blue sweaters. Dark, They're in their Navy moment, I guess. Um, and they cheered on their teams from their executive box and they seem to be really getting into the game. So uh, this was really cool. Um, they were saying that Prince George jumped up to give high fives to others in the box. So definitely a fun outing for them this is so sweet it's a great family bonding moment you know we love to see uh prince george and prince william together but i think it's also great it's so down to earth you know father and son going to the local you know the football match for the the team that they support together and you know aston villa isn't one of the biggest teams in the uk it's you know it's not like one of the top two really so for them to sort of appreciate a more low-key team i think is is really great and people just love it they love when when george and william and go to see Aston Villa play. I love it so much. All right, time to spill some royal tea. And like we were saying before, um, we're getting into some legal matter. So Prince Harry is expected to take the witness stand in London this summer to testify against Mirror Group newspapers over the alleged unlawful information gathering. So he's expected to testify 
early to mid-June. Um, so the Associated Press reported citing lawyers as a preliminary schedule of witness. The trial itself actually begins May 9th, which is just three days after the coronation, but still no word whether or not Harry will be there for the coronation. So as we know, Mirror Group Newspapers is the publisher of the Daily Mirror, Sunday Mirror, Daily Express, and more. And he, Prince Harry, alleges that his phone voicemails were hacked. So contesting the claims, the publisher argues that they were brought too late, according to the AP, and Prince Harry launched his claim back in 2019. I mean, he went over there to give his witness statement, so obviously he's going to be there to testify. I wouldn't be surprised if he is there at the beginning of this trial as well. Yeah, this is something that's really important to him. We've heard that, you know, press reforming the press is sort of his lifelong um, commitment to making those changes, making sure no one else sort of suffers the way that he suffered. And so I have no doubt that he's going to have a heavy hand in this lawsuit and really wants to, you know, make sure it stays in the front pages. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it'll be interesting. Like we said, it starts three days after the coronation. So who knows, maybe, I mean, it wouldn't look too good if he didn't show up to the coronation and then showed up to this three days later. So we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to see. <laughs> um, well, this is interesting. So Princess Kate allegedly had a difficult time reuniting with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle following the death of Queen Elizabeth. Um, as we all remember, these striking images when they had their walkabout at Windsor Castle in September of 2022, as they were greeting mourners. Um, well, so what happened now is that Robert Jobson, who's been on the show a few times, so he wrote a brand new book um, called Our King, and he alleges that Kate felt uncomfortable before stepping out for the cameras, writing, Catherine later admitted to a senior royal that such was the ill feeling between the two couples. The joint walkabout was one of the hardest things she'd ever have to do. So, I mean, Us Weekly at the time uh, reported that William extended the invitation to his brother and sister-in-law. As we know, things were icy at the time, still are. I, I would imagine that it was probably a little awkward. Maybe not the I think hardest was, thing she's ever had to do. <laughs> it was probably so awkward, but also they're, in, they're mourning themselves. You know, like the Queen was William's grandmother. You know, we've heard that they had a great relationship, William, Kate, and her late majesty, the Queen. Um, they're very close. I'm sure that, you know, that was a devastating loss. Yeah. Plus, they have to go out into public and put on a brave face and smile and meet these crowds of people, which if you've ever been to a royal event, if you've ever seen the amount of flash photography going on, that's overwhelming. And then you add this additional element of this sort of, you know, personal discourse between the two couples. I imagine that, I, again, it was it the most difficult thing, but I imagine it was so difficult. I mean, oh, just the emotional toll the emotional weight of that must have been really overwhelming. Totally. And then you're going out and doing this walkabout where you're meeting all of these other people that you've never met before who are also yeah. mourning the same person yeah. that you were close to. It's got to be such a weird out-of-body experience, I would imagine. Yes. yes. And you know, they absolutely could not have burst into tears like a normal person right. would have been able to do. They just weren't afforded that same sort. You just couldn't do that sort of thing because then you couldn't carry on. They wouldn't have been able to meet all those, as many people as they had hoped to. So just, I can imagine that that would have been a, such a difficult experience. Right. So, so, so difficult. I can't imagine. All right. Well, now it is time to break down the royal rules. And joining us this week is Emmy Award winning producer and director Tom Jennings, whose latest project, Charles, in his own words, premieres on Saturday, April 29th on Hulu and Friday, May 5th on Disney Plus. And he told us all about it. Take a look. Well, congratulations on this brand new documentary. I absolutely loved it. I loved uh, Diana in your own words, and I absolutely love um, this format and how you went about this. So what made you want to do King Charles in his own words? The Network National Geographic made me want to do <laughs> Charles in his own words, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the way it came about was when uh, the Queen passed last year, um, we started talking about, you know, who is Charles? Mm -hmm. Who is he really as a man, as a person behind the scenes? You know, he's kind of painted with a very broad brush in the media, and it's hard to really get to know him. And so fortunately for us, because we've done Diana in her own words, we did being the queen, somehow an American producer from, you know, in the United States winds up doing all of the Royals shows for them. And I think that gives us an advantage actually, because we're looking uh, as outsiders looking in. Mm -hmm. So they said, how would you do that? How would you get inside Charles's head? 
And what we wound up doing and what the show became is we went through hundreds, if not a thousand hours of media from his entire life and piecing together a narrative of the major topics in his life that have affected who he is, how he has reacted to things. And we wound up telling a really great story uh, just by assembling what he has said and done in the past. Definitely. It's like putting together a little piece of a puzzle. It really is. It's uh, it's it's amazing the amount of research and how much yes. work and time probably went into this. I mean, you um, asked the question before you're, you, you know, you want to ask that question. Who is King Charles? You want to get that answer after doing your research. What would you say the answer to that question is? He's much more complicated than I thought. Mm -hmm. To be honest, uh, there's more there there than I thought, mm -hmm. even af after having done Diana in her own words and being the queen, I really didn't have a grasp of who he was. Mm -hmm. I think understanding his childhood, what he went through, um, his disassociation with his father, Prince Philip, for example, um, trying to find his own way, being this stoic character. But then somehow he manages to, uh, if, as you saw in the film, he has a tremendous sense of humor at a very young age. Mm -hmm. He's doing all of these comedy skits at Cam while he's at Cambridge, mm -hmm. and he's actually very funny, and he has this great sense of humor on top of it. Mm -hmm. So there's a complexity to him that I think uh, a lot of people either aren't aware of or uh, disregard mm -hmm. uh, and just take the pieces of Charles that they want. And I think that he is, uh, in the past, I would say, he wouldn't be someone I put on the top of my list that I want to have dinner with if I could choose anyone in the world. But now I probably would. I think uh, I think he's a very interesting guy. And I think he does have a good heart underneath all of the chaos that surrounds him. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he does after May 6th when he's officially coronated. Like you said before, you you take a look at these relationships, his personal relationships that he had in his life with Diana, with Camilla, and of course, mm -hmm. as a father, I mean, were you surprised, not surprised, but what was your reaction when you saw kind of how he stepped up after Diana died or, you know, how present he really was as a father when Diana was in the picture too? And I don't think a lot of people really knew that about him. I didn't know that about him, uh, to be honest, even after doing the Diana film. Um, we found incredible footage. I mean, the whole thing is loaded with like either never seen or broadcast once kind of images. And for me, I'm a father. I have two sons. And um, to see him playing with his sons when his sons were like eight and 11, thereabouts uh, up in Scotland, running around, hearing what his hopes are for his children. You know, this is in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, their mom is still alive. The marriage is falling apart. But you look at that and, you know, uh, I am a sentimentalist, right. right? So I look at those images and I think, God, where, where did it all go wrong? Mm -hmm. Look at, look, just look, look at this. There was so much love in those, in that footage and uh, joy and happiness. And, you know, it's exactly what you would want a father and son relationship to be. And um, I was surprised that we found that footage and that he was, so close to them in that way mm -hmm. uh, because don't forget prince philip his father he he was i don't think there are images like that no. of charles with right. his father mm -hmm. but he certainly broke um uh, broke the cycle there and had that kind of relationship with the sons and i loved watching that and you know you think you know there's a moment in time so obviously several where he was extremely close to them and most of the world had no clue. And, um, you know, maybe they'll see this and say, huh, I didn't know that about, I think there's a lot of, huh, 
in right. this. Yeah, show. no, I <laughs> agree. As somebody that's been covering the Royals for quite some time, I definitely learned a lot about him that I, like you said, you don't realize how complex he really was. And, yes. you know, it, there's just so many different layers that I don't think a lot of people realize about him too. And of course you touch on, on spare and the fallout with mm-hmm. Prince Harry. I mean, mm-hmm. watching back all these interviews and um, doing your research, I mean, in your opinion, where do you think kind of what went wrong or the disconnect that happened between the two of them? Because they were so incredibly close. They were. Uh, I mean, it's apparent from uh, those images. Uh, and, you know, we found an interview with Harry in uh, 2005 talking about the press and how his uh, father tries to you know, yeah. protect them from the press. He does the best job he can. Um, I think. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my mom died when I was very young, so I can empathize with Harry. And I think the way that Diana died, um, uh, how she was just taken so quickly and he at such a young age for Harry, well, both boys, but especially Harry, um, I that's a wound that doesn't really go away. And I think he's just been hard. This is my opinion. I'm not basing it, uh, you know, uh, just on what I've seen and heard. And um, I, I think he's really angry that Diana was taken from him so early, and um, he needs a place to put that anger. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, whether you know it's the institution of the monarchy or Charles, I mean, and that's his right to do. You know, if he feels it's warranted. Um, but I think it was probably there all along. I don't know if there was an inciting moment, uh, all of the stuff with Megan, for example. Um, I didn't follow it close enough to say, oh, you know, right then when that happened, that, that was the tipping point that went over. I think it was just a slow build, uh, but I think the, uh, subtext to everything is that, um, Harry lost his mom when he was very young, and uh, that is something that uh, devastates a young boy. And it's a pain that doesn't really ever go away. And I think that feeds into everything else that's been going on with him and his father. I mean, do you think that he will be that rebel prince or will he follow in his mother's footsteps? Or do you think it'll be a little bit of a mix of both? As we It'll definitely chapter. be a mix. Mm-hmm. I'm leaning towards the rebel prince, but mm-hmm. again, with a slow burn, long game point of view, uh, I think he's going to uh, modernize the monarchy, as you had mentioned, slim it down, make it feel more contemporary. He'll probably, you know, he's a great love of uh, uh, architecture, for example. So he, he does uh love you know uh, things from the past i think the vestiges of the look and kind of vibe of the past will be somehow incorporated into our present uh i think that it will be a mix of both like you said for now Mm -hmm. and but uh, my prediction is watch as he succeeds at that watch it ramp up and up and up and up and up until we see the rebel prince in full. That's my prediction for you. It's uh, definitely a must watch. He he was on the show a, a few months back when he did his documentary, Diana, in her own words. And it's really, it's really fantastic the way that they piece together all of these old interviews, some never before seen interviews. So it's really, and you learn a lot about him, which is uh, definitely an interesting, uh, an interesting watch. I think it's been great to get to know Charles a little bit deeper. I think a lot of people just knew from the headlines or very base level. And now we're really getting to know him. And I I really love it. Definitely. All right. Moving on over to our pint size palace. And there are some reports that Louis may not be up to the coronation. Um, According to page six, he might not attend the May 6th ceremony due to his behavior at past events. But um, his older sister, Princess Charlotte, will be in attendance, uh, palace sources do say. I mean, he's only four years old. It's a long (laughs) time. I don't know if I'd want my four-year-old there as well. 
He'll be newly five. I think he turns five about right. 10 days before okay. the coronation. I have to say I took my, my, my son's a little bit younger than Louie and I took mm -hmm. him to Easter service on Sunday and he was like playing with Paw Patrol cars in the pew, in between the pews. I'm not sure that that would fly at a coronation. <laughs> right. So I think this one is totally understandable. Definitely. I think it's okay if he sits this one out, um, <laughs> but I mean, bad for us because we love the, the love to see it, love to see the silly faces. Love um, yeah, so who knows? Yeah. I'm sure he'll be around at some big events, though. Yeah, I think we will definitely see him at, maybe at the balcony appearance, yeah. definitely at some of these events, uh, perhaps the concert. You know, we might see another, you know, them uh, singing along and making silly faces. But will he be at this really sacred church ceremony? I don't know. <laughs> I'll we'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, that is it for this week's episode of Royally Us. Everybody keep commenting, keep subscribing, and we'll see you guys next week. For more news content and exclusive interviews, make sure to hit the sub, like, and bell button down below and visit usmagazine.com.